Hi everyone, that's me, Roman Nivolin. Uh, I work here at SciTech as senior software engineer at Project for Albert Heim. I also worked at well these fancy companies like Revolut, Groupon, Kareem. It's all quite big companies and they have something in common. And not only the things that I work there, but also that all these great companies, these great engineers, of some people, they all failed. And like they're failing a lot every day, usually in pretty stupid ways. So like I know, you're sitting in a room with great engineers, you sometimes you feel you'll never be as good as they are, and then you see some pull request with absolutely idiotic bug they wrote. How come? What happened? What happened to these smart people? But somehow it is happens. And yeah, so we can see like that's an engineer, let's think that's, think that's a smart engineer. And probably he's going to write a stupid code in like hour or two, maybe in a day, anyway. And somewhere in the screen there's a reason for that. There's a reason for all these bugs. It's here. So we are reason for our bugs. We are people. And we're always going to make mistakes. Uh, that's not something that we actually can fix. We view, try to make mistakes. What we can do is try to write code and try to design applications in a way that at least tries to prevent us from doing so. So what is it all about today? We are going to discuss it on three levels. So level one is when we write code, right? So we can make our code er less error prone, to make it safer, to keep it, uh, keep, make it keep us from making stupid mistakes. It is hard, but well, our code will try. Then we have our test level. So that's a moment when we already maybe made mistakes, but we still have a chance to find and fix it. So something happened. It's always a problem because usually a test uh, finding uh, well something but absolutely not everything however we will try to improve the level of mistakes we can find and also well sometimes mistakes will happen and sometimes tests won't find it and sometimes we'll have these mistakes on our environment what to do then what to do when this happened how we can well stop one bug from destroying completely everything so that's our purpose for today uh, here i have one warning I usually insert this warning when I'm adding some hardcore math to my talk or something like that. Uh, this time it's vice versa, it's going to be very simple. So I wrote quite a fancy title for the talk, so it might sound like I'm going to say something complicated. No, I'm going to say a lot of very simple things. I mean simple on a level when it might be insulting. I'm not thinking you're stupid, I'm just reminding you of very simple concepts and my goal is to remind you of them and create a simple checklist which you can go through when you write your application and like to ask yourself questions. Maybe I can make this better or that better or this thing. So I will arm you with this list of questions. And also another thing, I will give you some approaches, uh, but I usually say that programming is an art of trade-off. So when I'm giving you some approach, you can use it or not. What I'm saying is this, with this approach, you will have less possibility of mistake but maybe you will have lower performance or some other problems, right? So it's always a trade-off. I'm giving you an aim how to make less mistakes, how to make your code safer. It doesn't mean that you have to write all your code this way. It's just a tool that you can use. So here it is. And we are going to part one, to the coding part, the most interesting one. I will start with some pretty existential question. Why do we make bugs? So we all are good engineers, right? We have a lot of experience. We write code every day and still we are making stupid mistakes. So now it's a question to you all. Who have versions? Why do we make mistakes? What's happening to us? Your take. Sloppiness. Sloppiness. Something else. Laziness. Laziness also works. Distractions. Yes, and distractions. Time pressure. That's quite right too. So a lot of reasons and you know, usually when we made some mistakes and usually even when we find it we feel something like this because oh god how, what it was that simple i mean what is it how can you be such an idiot to write this stupid mistake so the thing is what i'm trying to say by this most mistakes are simple we are doing them not because it's something we don't know you never mentioned like lack of knowledge lack of expertise it's something it's distractions it's like human factor, like you're being too tired or something, or you're in time scramble. So mistakes are simple and solutions are kind of the same simple. Uh, most mistakes would be like, oops, I forgot to add validation. It should be there, but I just eh, been too lazy to edit or forgot or something. Sorry, happens. Or like, oh, oh, I'm using that variable, not that variable. Oh, it's a typo. Oh God, I like it. And I don't know, oh, that, that's how the function actually works. I read it, but I didn't understand. So. 
no luck. Um, and to try to think on how we can fix this kind of mistakes, let's take a look on very simple, very business function. Oh, yeah, it always happens. I had a comment, but I forgot about it. So what I think would help you to solve most of the problems, which is a good framework. My idea is that good framework reduces chance of human error. And what I mean by that is not Spring or this kind of framework. By framework, I mean your own infrastructure code that you write for your application, for your purposes, to solve your little problems, which you usually have in your validations, in your specific business case. So let's take a look on this kind of code. So very simple code, update product, something you do like in every application. You have product, you're updating it. But however, to understand what's going on, you have to spend some time. While code is very simple, I mean, code is here. You are just receiving some an image, adding it to product, and then saving it to some client, and then to some repository. Like something very, very simple. But somehow you have a lot of code around. For example, you have these logs. Informa like this code adds nothing to your understanding of the function. It's just logging, but it is there. Or for example, this validation. So in theory, it's a part of your business logic and you need this validation and so on, but it raises so much questions. Like why validate exactly these fields? For example, we're using these fields, why we don't have validations for them? And oh, this field could, could be less than zero. Is it like an okay -ish value or it's not allowed in any other function too? Or it's not allowed on this error? And if it is allowed in other functions, what does it even mean? So we're looking at the code and we have much more questions than answers. And it's not like specifically ugly codes that are wrote for this purpose. It's just, well, very usual business code and it's not even too bad. So somehow I think that if we can make code more understandable and if we can reduce the number of moving pieces of checks that we are doing, we can be safer. So for example, like in this validation that we have on screen right now, I can just simply write not less than zero, but more than zero, right? And it's something we do every day. Can we get rid of it? Of course we can. Uh, we can re get rid of it by having a good framework that helps us to do these things. Mm -hmm. So my idea is that good framework is something that first of all, solves boring stuff for you. So the reason why we don't write validations is because it's boring, right? So write another if, another uh, conditions and so on, or maybe I should write con this condition or maybe not. Come on, it would never happen. Who cares? Who would pass this value? No, no idiot would pass this value. No, I don't need this validation. And you do not write it. Uh, so yeah, you had, should have framework that does it for you, that leaves you no chance to not write it. Uh, also, it should hide from you non-business code, like this logging, for example, because it just adds two lines of code that you have to process with your brain. But actually, you don't even need it. So what you're doing here is just logging that you entered a function and exited function. You can do it with annotation, come on. And like without this annotation, you probably won't have a message. Oh God, you so need the message in logs, right? You're reading this text message so often when you see this million logs in your cloud. You're mostly looking for parameters, not for messages. So that's definitely not what you need. And you can do it with some annotations. Another important thing about any framework. So let's say we wrote these validations as a separate library, as a separate piece of code. We need to write it once and then never think about it. What I mean by that is that you have specific task, you wrote all possible APIs, all possible usages of this validation method, you tested it as hard as possible, you tested it in a million possible ways, even if it's very simple. And then you just never think about it ever again. So for example, if you have functions that checks that your amount is valid, you just write it once because probably your uh, business requirements for validity of the amount would never change, it's something pretty stable or if it would change, you should have it in one place. However, it should be well tested, it should be well checked, it should be as comfortable for use as possible because the more comfortable you make it, the bigger the chance that people actually would use it. But the thing is that you shouldn't even like make it easy to use. You should make it impossible not to use. Let me show what I mean by that. So for example, you have this function find image, right? Uh, you have product ID by which you are looking and you have image format that you are looking. And though well, pretty common thing, you are checking that your image format matches some regex. Because if it is just a random string, well, it could be anything, right? So anything can happen. So you are checking that it's actually a real image before sending it to some API. But the thing is that we can forget this check pretty easily. It's just, it's not written in stone. You can just, yeah, forget to write it and so on. So what you can do? You can just leave you no know, option to forget the check. Let's say we have our format as a class, image format, and we have this check in constructor. So now you actually have 
no way to enter the function without this check. Just physically impossible at all. And that's the thing. So we are making our no, our no, us no chance to make a mistake. The only way we can make mistake here is when we wrote this code once. But that's exactly why you have to make it as tested and as checked as possible. This infrastructure code should be the most tested code in your application, even if it's very small function. So for example, here, we practically have a logic only in, in constructor. And pretty often we do not test logic in constructors. We're just thinking, ah, okay, it's like it's some small stuff. No, here you should write a million tests for this very constructor. And I know it's boring, I know you're lazy to do that, but however, you should do it only once. Write it once and forget. So that's something quite important. And two other principles I want to mention is one is separate your external data from models. So what is the thing? Let's uh, talk about this string with image format. Probably we receive it from some user, right? From some user input request or anything. Uh, that's quite a common situation. And well, user input could be anything. So you have to validate it. But the thing is that when I work with business logic, I do not want to spend million times validating every field. I have my business model with million fields. I don't want to validate any of them. So when I write business logic, I want to be 100% sure that every field there is already validated. I should validate everything before I come to a level of business logic, of business models. My business models should be already clean, already verified. It should be separated from business logic. And my business logic is something that I'm completely sure about. So this way, my business code is clean from validations. So we have infrastructure code which checks this kind of stuff and so on, and we have business code, we are very business logic, because 90% of time we are doing this, we are writing business logic. We want to make it as simple as possible. And another thing, uh, here I'm, I was describing how we can hide non-business code. The thing is, you should never do the same with business code. So for example, once I've seen the thing, when there was a function, it originally received some product ID, and by this product ID, it was receiving product from repository. One person wrote a wrapper uh, with annotation that was automatically going to repository and receiving the sync. And I mean, he was like, we are doing it a million times everywhere. Now we are not duplicating this code. Now it's just notation. But no, it's not something you want to hide because when I look at the functions, that's what I want to know. What business actions I take. Go to repository is a business action. Validate like some value of a field, usually not because we have to have it always valid. We rely on it being valid. And going to repository is something you are doing because, for example, you want to control order sometimes of the separation or you want to check what happens if it well, failed and so on. So, yeah, that's something you should never hide. You should pretty strictly separate <coughs> these two ideas. And a checklist for this part. First of all, you should reduce chance of missing validations, authentication, anything. So if you see that your call could probably fail because you forgot to write, write something, you should try to think in a manner, how can I make it impossible not to write this code? How can I make my structure to execute this code? That's some very important principle. Another thing is making your model as specific as possible. So if your function can take like not the most wide model like string, but something more narrow, it might save you some time, save some debug and make error just much less possible. So that's another good principle. And separation. So you should separate external data from business models because business models are clean and external data are unpredictable. And you should separate business logic from infrastructure code. Again, kind of the same reason because when I'm looking at the function, I want only to see business logic. So yeah, here we're done with the first part and we are going to the other part, testing. And here I'm again going to write ask question. Raise hands who like to write tests. Yeah, not too much, but come on, come on, come on, tests are fun. It's the funniest part. It's so good, right? It's the heaviest part of the day when you're writing tests. No, because usually your tests look like something like this. Do you understand what's even going on there? That's a function that's just doing simplest of get requests and checking that it is 200 and the result is equal to something. And by the way, something you don't even know what it is. It's in some JSON, some, in some resource. So you look at this test, you see some amount of lines of code and none of them make sense. It's practically just a configuration. Shit. Of course you don't like writing that, right? Because you're just looking at some nonsense code, usually full of hacks, full of problems. Oh, damn. And in my opinion, it could be just 
four lines practically because we are duplicating a lot of stuff. We're duplicating configuration. Probably the setup of request would be the same everywhere. It always <coughs> would accept JSON, and yes, it always would have content type JSON. Come on, what else? And authorization would be the same. Everything else would be the same. And again, it's not an ugly code I wrote. I just took it from very random repository in my company. Actually, just one of the latest that I had in my IntelliJ as last opened. So yeah, I've not even been looking for that. Just the first one. And what I think you can do is you can somehow fix it by, well, uh, removing. By removing, for example, common initializations. Because you don't need to each at any test uh, say that your request should go to this exact URL and with this exact uh, accept type and so on, blah, blah. It would be the same in 99% times. Come on. And the same goes for implementation details. What I mean by that is that, for example, when we're using stops and mocks, pretty often our code looks a little bit ugly because mocks have very specific APIs. So your mocking library is pro designed to be used in any company, not in your project, but in any company. You can make it much more narrow. You can write your own helper function that would make your mocking look like something well readable and not just very technical thing. And of course, dirty hugs, just any test have it when you're no converts one type to another three times in a row and also you're trying to access some private field of some variable to check something and it's all in the same test code. You don't need to see that because that's a mess. And what is, what should it contain, it's even more important because what should it contain, contain is pretty simple things. It should contain specific initializations for your test. And by specific, I mean that, for example, if you always have some uh, data for every test, if for every test you always have initialized some basic state, you can initialize it in your basic function. But you should see what makes your tests different. So, for example, I have a test in my application uh, when I'm creating a product, an image is in database, and when I'm creating a project, an image not in database. That's what I should see in my code. It shouldn't be buried in some script in some resource. I should see in my code that I initialize this image and that I, that I save it to database. Otherwise, I won't understand what's the difference between these two tests. Never, only by name, but not by code, which makes test code practically useless. And yes, it's execution state, and I should see with which parameters I execute. And also, it's as specific verifications as possible. I will show concrete a little bit later. And yes, if you think it's a range act assert, it's exactly that. But there should be only a range act assert and nothing else. So what I mean by that, for example, is a test from my project. Uh, what we have, we are creating a product, we have image in database, and we have product with image. What we are doing, we are sending request with our product, and what we are checking then, we are checking that the image we actually created is a product with image, not just product without image. And if you would compare it to some other test, we will see the difference. So for example, what we do not have in the second test, we do not have image. And we specifically saying that, hey, our API should return no image when we are trying to request it. And what's the result? In our verify step, we assertion that product is being created without image, just product. So we can see the difference here. We don't need to go to some script for that. We see the details that makes tests different. So if you have the same details in your test, you should have it in initialization. You should have it somewhere. But if that's the details that make your test different, they should be in test. And also, as you can see, it's hard to understand which framework I use here, or what libraries, or anything, because it's hidden. You don't interested in libraries. You're interested in details of your test and business details. You're interested in question what changed, what's going on. And it's not taking too much time writing these libraries, because usually for me, it just, I don't know, I write this very specific code, and then just extract it to functions. It's not too specific, come on, you just have to give it a proper name, usually. And that's it. So we do not have technical details. We only have differences. So you should keep, another thing, you should keep your test as close to reality as possible. That's the hardest part, usually, because real world, we have all the databases, we have all the external services, and so on, blah, blah, and in our test environment, well, we are limited. So just a couple of very simple tools. I'm pretty sure most of you know them, but however, that's first of all test containers. I use pretty often all the time because test containers just allows you to, well, uh, work in your integration test with real database and initialize it with real data and so on, and practically margin of error, margin of difference between your application and between, well, something deployed and test is much less in this case. So it's a good thing if you're not using it, I just recommend to check and so on. It 
changed quite a lot test environments. And another thing is Wiremog. It's kind of doing more or less the same, but for external APIs. So here you can mock your external APIs and it would work the same way as you work with APIs usually. So you would send requests, you would receive responses. The only thing you have to program for which request you receive which responses. But however, that allows your application to stay as close to reality as possible. That just two tools I recommend checking. And another thing I recommend checking is mutation testing and property-based testing. So again, I'm not going in details here. That's not the purpose of the talk, uh, but both things helping you to extend your test coverage, to mm, test uh, your code in more like different ways. So for mutation, uh, for property-based testing, I've shown examples in code, and code test is quite a great library uh, that I have it implemented, but practically property-based testing now exists for any language, any popular language at least, so you can just Google property-based language uh, testing plus your language and you would find something. And for PyTest, for example, or for that, yeah, for mutation testing, for example, in Java standard is PyTest. It's also quite great and works much faster than the same libraries was working like five years ago. So I can recommend that. And here we are moving to a checklist. You should move common initializations from test. So never have initializations that look all the same in all your tests. It's just killing uh, the ability to read tests. It's making it boring the same and copy pasted. So that make it useless usually. You should hide framework implementation details. Usually for that you need one, two helper functions. It's nothing too specific. It's quite easy to make. You should keep specific initializations in test, not in some file. Because when you have your initializations in resource, in SQL file or anywhere, it breaks your control. You're not controlling your setup anymore. You set up in a lot of things and that's just a mess. That makes a lot of uh, problems like between tests. That makes it much harder to read, to understand, to understand the difference between tests. So I recommend you doing so. And also try to reproduce your real environment. It's hard, but however, there are tools for that. And also, some of, this some of these ideas, they look very much the same as what you have to do to code. So my very simple uh, final advice to work in this test, treat it as code, finally. It's not some garbage. You shouldn't just write some stupid code there and rock a head because, come on, it works, it tastes green, cool, it's green. I don't want to work with this anymore. Because no one likes writing tests, I've seen it there. But you should treat it as code. And this way, it would become much more comfortable writing tests. So you should just think about it as about code for some moment. So yeah. And the third part is runtime. You push the wrong code. Oopsie. What should you do? Your ideas. Rollback. For example, rollback. Okay. What else? Push wrong code again. Maybe this time it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It might do. Go home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, usually when you're call, when you have some bugs in your run time, you're confused. You're quite confused. You don't know what to do, and you have this question like, what should I do? Nothing. You've done enough stupid human. Now it should be automated. So first thing, all the incident uh, resolving in your runtime should be as automated as possible. You should have as much processes as possible that helps you to not. Uh, allow buggy code to be in your real environment. So, automate it as much as possible. And what I mean by that, first of all, it's simple. Never push red build. I know, it's, it's a rule, but we're, we're all doing that. Please stop. Because if we're pushing red builds, nothing would help. I mean, you, you can have million automations, but if you're just ignoring them, well, sorry, you can't do anything. Employ end-to-end -end and smoke testing. Uh, and I, I, I guess we even had a talk about smoke testing today, so quite in time. Uh, but however, these two things are usually helping you to test something you can't test locally. It helps you to test the whole environment, how things are connected. But that's something we pretty often forget about, because like, eh, I as Java developer tested my application, so I won't write it. And this other developer tested his application, and everyone tested their application. How they integrated? God knows how. It somehow works or not. No one knows. So you should have some tests checking it as a large thing. And yeah, again, it's a point for another big talk for smoke testing, we had one. However, just not forget about it, think about it. And health checks, canary releases, automated rollbacks. Uh, who knows what canary release is? This canary release thinking. A so partial release to see if it's working. 
Uh, it's ki kind of, kind of, yeah. So practically, canary release is yeah when you are releasing your code in one uh, server, one node, and you giving it like little bit amount of load and checking what's going to happen. Is it going to fail or not? How are going our how our health parameters going to look here? Uh, how it would work? And for this uh, to work, we also need health checks and automatic rollbacks because we need something to check if this release is alive and if everything goes well. And we need a mechanism to roll it back if everything gone wrong. But important part, automatically. Because human can be ill, human can be stupid, human can notice nothing. So you should make it as automated as possible. I have yeah an article about it here. Uh, you can... Check it, it's quite a good one, but practically I guess it Google is just the first if you Google can release. It's quite popular. Uh, so yeah, and another thing is smart load balancing. I wanted to attach article for that, but said is the one I wrote is in Russian, so sorry. You can try to learn one, but it's not the best time for the language. However, uh, <laughs> maybe one day. Uh, but however, <laughs> however, what I mean by that, is uh, that let's imagine you have your metrics and you have metric like latency, which allows you to check how good your service performs, how good it works, how stable and alive it is. And you can configure your load balancing to balance not uh, equally between all the nodes, but balance based on these metrics. If your service have low latency, if it works slow, you give it much less load. And if it works faster, you give it more load. And this way you can preserve problems like, I don't know, broken data center, for example, or some nodes working slowly or some machines working bad and so on. So that's another thing to look in and explore again, point for a big toll, but something to think about. So yeah, and the second part of it is you should observe it all. So again, observability is quite a popular topic right now for talks. I'm not going to explain it right now in like five minutes left. Uh, but what I'm going to do is to mention some basic buzzwords. Logs, metrics, tracing, do not forget any of it. So what you should log is usually parameters, not messages. When you're trying to log messages, it's pretty useless because you have you know, your giant log of 100 messages you're reading at all. Come on, try read some book, it's better. Uh, and in logs, logs, you mostly need parameters. You mostly need to know what exep exception you received, in which class, and so on. So you need something that can be collected automatically, not by you writing a message, and you should collect it automatically. The same goes for metrics. You should measure your performance. You should measure how fast your fu functions work, how fast your database operations are, how fast your web operations are. And it's not only in case if your operation is uh, some high performance. No, by performance metrics, you can see that something gone terribly wrong, like memory leak or something. So your application can be not performance related at all, but you can just receive some dead loop and so on, and at some moment, no performance would be enough and everything would just die. And if you have metrics, you usually would be notified before everything dies. So metrics and alerts and well tracing because we live in a world of cloud and microservices. It's usually quite hard to trace one request between these 10 calls of uh, different services and so on. So work on your tracing. It's quite important too. So performance metrics I just mentioned. And yeah, if you received an error, not write a log message like, oopsie, sorry, something happened. Try to write everything about your error, your stack trace, every damn detail you can get there. Because if you do not write this detail there, you would have to reproduce the bug, you, have, you would have to set breakpoints there and so on. Try to think what information would you need when you debug and write it down before you debug. So that would make it so much faster. And also don't forget about dashboards because right now when you have alerts, a lot of people forget about dashboards. They are thinking like, okay, if I have something bad, I would be alerted. But pretty often you do not have alerts <coughs> in some situations. You forgot about that, that happens. Uh, but you can see that, I don't know, some performance values are acting weirdly. What happened? You would look, you would investigate, and dashboards usually help you here. So yes, that's it. And you know, all that might not help. So if you screwed it, please write your postmortems. It's something that is very boring and you don't want to do that because you just screwed. Everything is felt and you want only to forget about it. Forget, but first try postmortem, please. Because, yeah, otherwise you would have the same problem over and over again. And good postmortem is describes what happened, why did it happen, what exactly failed. And 
the most important part for me usually is why didn't we discover the problem automatically? I'm a big fan of discovering everything automatically. And if we didn't have any, I don't know, alert or test failed or everything, on all this level we failed. Something happened, so we should uh, improve these levels. We should add new alert, we should add new tests, something, new process. And also, well, how can we discover such a problem in the future? This kind of related to the previous point. So, yeah. And I guess on this note, uh, we're moving to, to a checklist. So it's quite simple. Automate all possible checks. That's what I said. Observe how everything happens in your application. Well, also quite obvious self-explanatory. Write post-mortems. And which is even more important to please actually do what you wrote in the post-mortem. Because after writing post-mortem, you also want to forget about it and never improve anything. Because, well, you failed. No one has to know about that. I will kill everyone who observed. But no, please. So, yeah, and on this note, yes, that's it. It's me, Romans, it's my contacts. Uh, you can practically find me with the same username everywhere. Thank you.